tonight's topic was prompted by um, a poem that I had told you about, where the it's called the first letter of the Hebrew women write to St. Paul. <laughs> so <laughs> it kind of fit my sensibilities. And then of course, as a result of um, all the research, I came out in a different place than where I began. So tonight it will be a little focus on the redemption of Paul. Um, so let's, before we start the slides, let's, let's kind of gather what we know about St. Paul. And we'll build the narrative before we start looking at what I chose. So um, what do we know? There's a few There's churches two. named after him. A lot of churches named after him. That's for sure. That's for sure. He was a Jew. A good Jew. And a Pharisee, I think. Yes, the Pharisee who studied under Gamaliel. Mm -hmm. Did quite uh -huh. a bit of traveling and wrote a lot of letters. Let me try this. Oh, I know why. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Works better if you plug it in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was doing art earlier and I took everything apart. Um, I'm sorry. So I missed the last comment. Patricia said he was a good Jew. And, and wrote a lot of letters. Yep. He wrote a lot of letters and did a lot of traveling. Yes. Yes, Sylvia. Wrote a lot of letters, did a lot of traveling. He always sounds very impassioned. Impassioned. Okay. Some people have trouble understanding his letters. Yes, yes, because there were um, site specific for one thing. Some people just don't like what he had to say. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> there is that. Okay. Who in particular might not like what he had to say? Oh, I don't know. If you're doing a reading, you know, and you don't know what the heck he's saying trying to figure it out so that you can do the reading with some sort of intelligence. Yes, it's true. It's true. Context matters a great deal because you, you really want to know what situation he's addressing. And also observing the commas when you read. Yeah. <laughs> you can't just rattle it off. You have to practice. Yeah. Run on sentences, right? Exactly. On and on, paragraph after paragraph, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to find him a good editor. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did he have another name? It always amazes me in the Bible that they talk about John, who was also Bill and Fred and somebody <laughs> else. So he had a Jewish name and a Greek name. His Jewish name was Saul. He was born of Jewish parents in Eastern Turkey. Um, they were Roman citizens as he was, and his uh, Greek name was Paul. And he but was that, from uh, Tarsus in Asia Minor, so he wasn't from the Jerusalem area. Right, right. Although he was a Roman citizen by virtue of his, his parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else? Well, he seems to have um, to have some things to say uh, to women, like you know, <laughs> don't wear jewel, jewelry of gold and pearls, and keep your head covered, and that sort of thing. But on the other hand, within the churches, there was Phoebe the deacon, and uh, you know, other women in leadership roles in the church. So he can't be all uh, all bad. It's true, and that's what we're going to explore a little bit more of that. So we have on the one hand X, and on the other hand Y. So documentation um, that is not, um, yeah, is not always congruent. Well, so he in the society he lived in then, yeah. in terms of, yeah, his attitude. And he did live in different places. 
for different periods of time. George. I always thought that he was a man of structure. He wrote, yeah, well, he, he was a lawyer. We'll get Joe to answer that. Um, he was uh, really good at, about the law. So you're right, uh, more structure, more structured arguments, more structure in terms of belief and practice. And in fact, he did have some arguments, um, not just with women, but with others about practice in the early church. In fact, he argued with Peter in Jerusalem about whether Gentiles needed to be circumcised <clears throat> and become Jews before they could become Christians. So Paul won that argument. Um, of course, most of the people to whom he was, uh, with whom he was establishing churches were, were in the Gentile. Well. I suppose he was a patron saint of group, some groups, was he? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I didn't come across that. But we will see. We, well, he, yeah, he wasn't part of the circumcision party, but, um, <laughs> but he, how he is depicted in iconography is significant. And, uh, we know that from one of the extra canonical uh, writings, I was supposed to go down in the basement and see if I could find that, um, that he was bald um, of short stature, apparently under five feet tall, was bow legged um, and really not an imposing physical uh, personage at all, but certainly his words, uh, speak, there's Diane, his words speak for himself. So, and there were other, there was a major conversion experience, right? So we do know about Paul's journeys and experiences, not just from his letters, but from the second half of the book of Acts. And we know that he was a zealot um, had a lot of energy for persecuting the early church and was known to be present at the stoning of Stephen and was on his way to Damascus to get rid of more pesky Christians and was knocked from his horse by with an encounter at the an encounter with uh, God, with Jesus, who said, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, what do you, what, what's the matter there? And um, so he was blinded by that encounter, by that light, by that experience, and entered the house of another, of a Christian who prayed for him and his sight was restored. But he was pretty shaken by that experience. He spent, um, as near as they can tell, three years in Damascus um, before he came back and began this incredible journey. The first of three missionary journeys that we know about, uh, finally ending up in um, Jerusalem. So um, you, I think, Many of you are probably aware that not all of the letters that we think um, that we attribute to Paul were actually written by Paul. So the scholars now agree that maybe just uh, six letters, six out of all those letters were actually penned by Paul. So that begins to... Um, begins to alter uh, how much weight we give to certain to certain writings and including the writings um, about women so let me tell you that um, let me see which ones I wrote down here so the authentic ones that the, the scholars agree on are uh, letter to the Romans the first and second letters to the Corinthians, the letter to the Galatians, to the Philippians, first Thessalonians, 
And then that sweet little one by Lehman about um, Onesimus, the runaway slave. So that begins to shift the ground. But I, I have a bias. I had a bias, more of a bias against uh, Paul, mostly for the prohibitions against women. And so I've kind of lightened my tone <laughs> by, by the end of this. Um, I want to ask another question. Well, I have a question. How do they know who, whether they were authentic or not by him? I mean, is this going back to manuscripts and handwriting and how did, who says that and how do they know that only six were attributed? Linda's <clears throat> frozen. Well, it looks like Linda might be frozen, but, yeah. uh, but, she, but she will come back. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> But uh, to answer the question, and um, you know, one of the things I would suggest is, you know, if, if you get a chance to take EFM, um, that would probably be a wonderful study uh, uh, for uh, for Bible. Uh, Nancy is in EFM. I, you know, Nancy and I are in the same group actually, and I know Patricia, you know, has been in EFM before, an EFM mentor. But basically, a lot of the reason why um, the um, there are several letters that you know that are attributed to Paul, but a lot of scholars think are not Pauline, are because of the language, um, and it goes back to the Greek. I mean, you wouldn't be able to necessarily tell this just from an English, you know, but the Greek is written in such a way. The word choices are such that um, you know that some of the things that are there, uh, you know, don't sound like um, you know what would be authentic Paul. And then there's some uh, there's some um, there's some issues where you know as time gets time goes by some of the language particularly when it comes to dealing with uh, the household um, you know rules like you know what should women do what should men husbands do what should slaves do I mean all those kind of things they get progressively more rigid. Um, and more locked in as, uh, you know, the later some of the letters are. And there's some who just say, well, you know, people, you know, first of all, people could change their opinions. But, you know, the other thing is, is that because of the word choices and so forth, um, a lot of people would say, well, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't sound like it's written by the same guy uh, that we think of. And we have good, and there are good reasons to think that Paul actually did write the letters to the Romans and to Corinth and the Galatians and Philippians and so forth, just because of the, the content of the letters um, and what he, what he had to say. So um, that may not be persuasive to you, but, um, but, but uh, absolutely, um, you know, what, uh, um, uh, what Linda was saying Uh-oh. Another frozen person. <laughs> oh, now, Joe, you're, fro you're frozen. And Linda has vanished. <laughs> yeah. And that's, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, Linda's disappeared. Oops. Yes. And if she is the host, is there anyone else who can let <laughs> her back in? Oh, there's Joe back. Oh, there we go. I, you froze I probably, up. Yeah, I must have. I was in the middle of this long explanation, and no wonder I got some blanks. <laughs> That's how you get cut off. I guess. I guess. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, no, thank you for that. I, I didn't know that, and and I guess uh, I guess they have no idea then who wrote the others, pretending to be Paul, or well, do they? Because I haven't taken this EFM thing. Well. Well, uh, this, like I said, this EFM thing is, is good. I would highly recommend it. Um, but um, it's not only EFM. I mean, there are, um, most of the, most of the uh, scholarship would be to the effect that the letters that are not attributed to Paul are probably people who were followers of Paul or 
followers of Paul from particular churches. Um, it's just that they use different language and some of their concepts are a little bit a little bit different. So, you know, you can you can look at Paul and find support for lots of stuff. Uh, you know, it, it you know, so it you never know. And that and that's not that, that may not be atypical because Paul, you know, wrote in the letter to which one was it to um, I forget the one where he's in Athens, you know, and talking maybe that's in Acts, I guess it is, probably is what it is. Um, and it's saying, well, you know, when you're in Athens, you be like the Athenians, you know, you um, you know, talk to them the way that they want to be talked to. So anyway, Linda, I'm sorry. And you're yeah, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I got thrown off. <laughs> I don't know. Our our Zoom thing failed over here. So anyway, grateful it, grateful that it's back. Um so I think that and you said you had um, one more question you were gonna ask. What you were well, gonna... oh yeah, thank you, Patricia. What I wanted to know is what you think about when I talk about women in Jesus's um, <coughs> circles, do you think that women had much power in first century Palestine? Well, there were women bankrolling his ministry. So there were women of property uh, among his followers. Yeah. And there are some more anonymous uh, mentions of, you know, and and also the women, right? You know, we're going to feed 5,000 men and also the women. And um, yes, he did bank. He was bankrolled by a number of women followers. So there were women of wealth and substance surrounding Jesus. So... And we do believe uh, from the post uh, canonical scriptures that Mary Magdalene in particular in the gospel of Mary, that was one of the new discoveries in the uh, Qumran scrolls. That Mary, had, Mary Magdalene had, had quite a role, a leadership role uh, after Jesus's death and perhaps within the Jesus circle while he was still alive, there was a notoriously bad argument between her <laughs> and Peter um, about, well, why would he tell her these things and not tell them to us? I mean, she's just a woman. Um, so, but there were women of substance around Jesus. So Paul would have known that there were women of power within religious circles. So I think that we um, think that maybe, maybe his prohibition was against Jewish women at the time, but that's not really true at all. And we're gonna get into that a little bit later. Joe, you're frowning. Oh, no, 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 I think Dorothy <laughs> had a comment. Uh, Dorothy, okay. I, I think you're had a so. No, I was, I was, uh, it's very similar to what Patricia was saying that women who of means obviously were more entitled and had, had more, there, there was status in society. And so they would have had that access. Right. The money. You know. Also, there are some, just some hints, some slight echoes about when Jesus was in the synagogue and was teaching or when they were going up to the temple or so on, where there were women there. I mean, his mother and his brothers and sisters were there. So they were not, although there's a court of women in the temple in Jerusalem, the court of the Gentiles and, and so on, everybody was separated for those major festivals when they visited the the temple, it seems as if the local area may have been much more egalitarian than we knew. And I don't think, I don't think that was really typical 
of that time or place. I mean, I think the, the culture and at that time, uh, women were in fact very in very subservient uh, uh, roles uh, to uh, to men, and I either I can't remember. Um, Joe, maybe I think Dean Kate has even mentioned at times. You know, the name Mary was very widespread because how much did it matter what a woman's name was? I mean, it was yeah. really um, whether that's true or not. I don't know, but. That, that women were definitely uh, in, in a much lesser role. So the group around Jesus is unusual. Well, I think also the fact that more women are unnamed yes. makes, makes us, um, gives us what they call a hermeneutic of suspicion. So we want to know, well, here are the men's names. So where are the women's names? It wasn't just an unnamed woman. Who was the Samaritan woman at the well? Who was that? Um, which, which woman washed the feet of Jesus? Which, you know, uh, what was the name of the woman that was bleeding with the hemorrhage? You know, um, all of those. So there is, it does make us wonder. So there's contradictory evidence and i think that's part of what we find anytime we're we're looking at history because we've got people who write the history and then others who are written about or who are written out or as the womenist Women. scholars would say would write from the underside they those stories are told on the underside of the text so are you saying the things that he he might have said to diminish women. You said there were a few hints, I eh, that. Yeah, women, we'll get, well, yeah, let's, yeah, kind of, but, okay. but are you saying that it wasn't a typical of women's role at that time? Others might have done it as well. Perhaps, or, or and I mean, it's just like all of us, right? The church in Canada looks different than the church in the, Epis the Episcopal Church in the US or Jacksonville, even though it's a city of a million, doesn't look like Ottawa, which is also a city of a million. You know, I mean, each context has its own structure. Some were, some cities were influenced by the trade routes. Um, Sepphoris, for example. Um, and some were more isolated. So that too plays a factor in the development of community, what those communities look like. Okay. Dorothy. My suspicion, and I, I'm not precise on this, is that the Roman Catholic Church sort of based the priesthood on the apostles being men, you know, just men, but they were all unmarried men. They, I mean, I, I'd never thought of it before, Surely there must have been a number of apostles that had wives that would have, you know, that are never mentioned within the context of Jesus. You know, oh, we know that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. So there must have been a woman around there somewhere exactly, <laughs> attached yeah. to Peter, right? That's yeah. the only one that I've heard of where there's a wife. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Oh, let's look at the first slide if we can. Let's see what you notice. This let's is see, pretty. You, yeah, are you going to do this, uh, Linda, or do you want me to share the slide? No, I'm going to have you do it if that's okay. 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 Well, let me see if I can do it. So hold okay. on. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, oh. excellent. Excellent. Okay, so this is um, as Elizabeth began our discussion. Fracture that screen is my screen is wonky. Um, okay, so what do you notice um, in the background here? Ship. Yes. And in the foreground.
women. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, and their heads are them. their heads are covered. Yeah. But yes. So this is uh, fairly typical of uh, stained glass windows um, about St. Paul and behind him is a figure representing Jesus. And this Pauline figure is, has a hand raised in blessing. But yes, the ship, the water, the mountains, which give us a sense that he was somebody who was known for not staying in one place. Okay. All right. Second slide, Joe, please. Mm -hmm. All right. This is what started it all um, for me. <laughs> and if, if somebody would read that, please. David Kinlock. I can read it, Linda. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the first letter of <clears throat> Hebrew women to St. Paul. Hebrew women, apostles of Christ Jesus to Paul. Alleged saint, notorious scribbler, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now look here. <laughs> Adam uh, could have said no thanks or apples uh, disagree with me. <laughs> he didn't. He had a bite as well. So he was deceived, just like Eve. Uh, we are in pool and get used to it. We washed his feet, made his tea, stood under the cross. Where were you? On, the, on some road to Damascus. Useless. Useless. <laughs> Chapter, Chapter two. two, this new covenant is all very well, but we have a soft spot for the old one. That tabernacle had our best candlesticks in it, a gold jar with jam by Lana and a lot of tablet. We want it back. You promise this and you promise that. Be quiet. Let the hidden person of the heart speak out. Chapter, Chapter the last. last. Every, Every Tom, Tom, Dick, and Harry's given hospitality at yours in case they might be angels. Fine. But haven't you noticed the spinning saucer we've got above our heads? Faith is a stubborn doubt before you despair of and the conviction of things you can see with your own eyes. Oh, that's telling us. <laughs> so let's, let's what, chapter in, what chapter in the Bible is that? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Let's go let's back, go back to, the to the phases. I'm getting a feedback. Yeah, yeah, I think I we're going to have to mute. To mute. Unless we're speaking. speaking. Joe, can you get us back to? Yeah, OK. Oh, back to the, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, could we go back to? Gotcha. Good. There you go. I don't know what's going on with this tonight. Anyway, OK, so what, what do you think about that poem? I mean, that. Uh, well, yeah, it's a poem. I asked what chapter in the Bible is that one? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the Scottish Highland chapter. <laughs> no, I guess Glasgow is not in, in the Highlands. Anyway. I didn't see the author of that, though. It was off the top right. of the page. OK, it's um, his name is David. Kinlock. Oh, it's a he. It's a he. Yeah. Which wow. Is why, why I loved it. I'm going to use a couple more of his poems later. Um, in this series, but yes, it's what one of the things that pleased me that um, he thought that there might should be another response to Paul. 
I like this shot at Adam too. Yes, because we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna take a look at one of the troublesome passages attributed to Paul next. But that's, you, you can almost see them standing up straight and saying, now look here, <laughs> wasn't just us. <laughs> Notorious Scribbler was kind of a, <laughs> a jab. Yeah. 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 But it also, it, it, it copied the style of the, the salutation. You know, that would yes. be very Pauline. And then what I always call, like in business letters, the blah, 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 dear sir, and all that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the standard pattern of um, letter writing in, in that time period. A certain and address and then, and then the agenda and then the certain leave taking. And then stick it to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the heart of the matter, right? Yeah. And the women had the spinning plates above their heads. So what is that? Is that halos? I oh, thought so. I interpreted it to be. Yeah. I, I did as Patricia's halos, but who knows? Maybe they really were spinning plates. That made me think about, yeah, how many things do people have to keep in order yeah. um, how many for, balls the, can you for, the, for the world to keep spinning? Yeah. I thought it was just a, a basic comment that, well, you know, Paul said, well, it's good to be hospitable. I mean, that was a very common virtue in, at that time. But, you know, where did the, the brunt of being hospitable get born? I mean, it's by the women who had to spin the plates above their heads to keep, get the food fixed and, you know, do the hospital. It's like a Martha, you know, thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus, you know, talked about Mary being the one who had, who had the, who made the better choice. But Martha said, but wait a minute, you wouldn't have anything to eat if it wasn't for me. Get her in here to help me. I mean, I appreciate it. Yeah. And not only that, you bring all your friends with you. <laughs> of course. It's like my husband saying, is it okay if I bring the archdeacons home for lunch? Oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah. But I like luckily, the fact that it's not... I keep a prairie kitchen. I can feed people from the cupboards for weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And he probably told you five minutes before, right? Well, 10 maybe. <laughs> I like the fact that this poem is also theological in its agenda. Because the other major piece that they're, they're complaining about is throwing out the old for the new mm -hmm. and their attachment. Um, in fact, their work um, in the sanctuary. We like the old covenant. Those vessels are ours, the tablets, the manna jar. We have, they have been our touchstones for a long time. And it sounds as if they're not quite convinced as yet that they have to throw out the old to welcome the new. Could you repeat the line at the end uh, about faith and doubt? Yeah. Just faith is a stubborn doubt before what you despair of and the conviction of things you can see with your own two eyes. Faith is a stubborn doubt before what you despair of and the conviction of things you can see with your own two eyes. It's really an awkward sentence, isn't it? Yes, is it a doubt about the conviction or are it two, two different things? It needs a comma. Yeah, it needs something. It needs I guess we need Paul back in the room <laughs> <laughs> to, add, 
to add more, but I just, it just made me smile um, that oh. there was. Hmm? Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, I mean, faith is particularly if you're a Protestant, I mean, that is, that's the key to Paul is, well, you know, we're saved not by works, but by faith. Um, mm -hmm. And and Paul, you know, or at least, and this is one of those things that Elizabeth and I were talking about earlier about, um, you know, which letters did Paul, was attributed to Paul. Well, Hebrew, the letter to the Hebrews was one of the letters or one of the books that was, that's often attributed to Paul, but not by very many scholars anymore, but that's the one that has the definition of faith is faith is the, is, you know, about things unseen. Um, uh, I forget the exact quote, but um, being a Baptist, I know it's chapter, it's 11, chapter 11, verse one, I know that. So, um, but it's, but I think that what David Kenlock and, and those Hebrew women are talking about here is a is really calling into question well okay you're so you're so all fired hot on this you know we're saved through faith what is that um you know we 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 believe that it's something that's really much more important than just something we can't see it's it's the it's the doubt before the final despair something like that i i don't know i mean that's the way i was hearing it so and also um it's also faith in what what's already known can be seen because they, mm. he mentions the tablets and in essence, the tabernacle um, as well. Yeah. Yep. I think I that uh, reluctance to take on the new is something we're all going to face, certainly in the Canadian church. Once the pandemic is over, I think church will look very different going forward from here. And I think that's going to be difficult for people who say, well, we're just going to get back to doing everything we used to do. I don't think so. So that, that, that's a kind of warning in this piece, I think, for us as well. Is that going to be similar to the reaction that people had when the BAS came in and, oh, we like the, you know, remember that? We like the Book of Common Prayer and, and the vote based and the vows and all that stuff, you know, that, and I mean, the Book of Common Prayer is so old now. It's not, it's not the new, uh, not the Common Prayer, but the alternative service is so, so old. But people still forty years. It. It's yeah, it's almost forty years old now. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think but that during during the pandemic, um, many people have been free to worship in a variety of locations, mm -hmm. and so uh, in fact, we're perhaps less bound by our local community than we have been. So because we've been able to be exposed to so many other styles. I mean, I, on Sunday, I was listening to a wonderful deacon in the Rocky Mount, no, Black Mountain, North Carolina, somewhere. Um, I just, St. James, is it yep. Episcopal Church? So this gal was using a favorite childhood book, um, Judith Boris, Alexander and the No Good, Horrible, Very Bad Day. Um, and she did a brilliant job. And it was just, it was fun. Um, and then I was surprised by the priest who said, we're going to say the creed now. We haven't said it during the pandemic. Uh, we're back because we shortened the service. Now we're back together. And perhaps you're going to have trouble with that today. And we're standing in the received faith um, of the tradition of the church. And we're also trying to find a new place. And I thought that was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary statement. So we'll see yeah, what happens. Much more, much more fluid, I suspect. You know, yeah. as, we might really locked to all saints westboro all the time kick and choose and very free yeah okay let's go to um the slide number two uh, michael you're back do you want to do that i'll be glad to let me share okay. the screen okay um,
Is this the one you wish? Oh, uh, sorry, number three. Yes, would somebody like to read the text? I could do it. Do it. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I desire then, I won't say the letter of St. Paul because I don't believe this is the letter of Paul. Right. I desire then that in every place, the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. And also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with submission. I permit no one, no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. And then from Philippians, I urge Eudoia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my lower, loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Okay, so you can hear, thank you, Patricia, you can hear that this was part of the pushback, um, part of the place for the pushback. And also a place in Philippians where two women were arguing and it was the letter writer's intention that they reconcile. So they're named, named as loyal companions, these women who were working alongside him in the work of the gospel. And the one that's been most um, telling for feminist scholars has been this portion of Romans 16. Um, that can go up next, Michael, thank you. Slide number four. Okay. Who would like to read this? I'll try it. It's very small. Okay. Um, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at San Cray, so that you may welcome her in the Lord, Oops. as is fitting. I've lost the right. Thanks. As is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, and who risk their necks through my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Apenas, Apenatus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Adronicus and Eunea, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampli Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our coworker in Christ and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my relative Herodian, wouldn't have read this if I knew all these names. Greet those in the <laughs> Lord. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Trephania and Trephosa. Greer, the beloved, Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, mother to me also. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philogus, 
Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Thank you. This um, one third of the names listed in this final greetings to the church are women. And it was Elizabeth Schusser-Fiorenza who told us about the ending of um, the Greek names, Trifana and Trifosa, for example, are twin sisters. Um, but that it was, um, it was wonderful to hear that that leadership was firmly established all over the place. And that <clears throat> here it is by, by what we believe is Paul's hand. So that's very different than what you heard in the first letter to Timothy saying, uh, you know, no woman is allowed to speak. So also Priscilla, Prisca and Aquila were um, tent makers that, with whom Paul lived for quite a while and was able to, to pay his way. And they also, um, that town was well known for weavers as well as tent makers. So very different understanding of living and, and sharing community. Anything else about this or the other texts that you want to mention? Well, with this one, he's being very specific. He's not just saying, oh, they're wonderful. He's describing, you know, um, character, characteristics and yeah, the type of kids. endeavor that each person did. It's a very warm part um, It is. It gives you a sense that um, he has good relationships with all these people. And you do know that the, uh, in some earlier translations of scripture, the people who transcribed the text named Phoebe as a deaconess rather than as a deacon. Uh, it was a gender bias in the translator, on the part of the translator. And that was restored. This is in RSV. Um, translation. This was an important skill testing question in Tuesday night's trivia night at All Saints Westboro. One of the categories was women of the Bible. And oh, yeah. One was the, uh, who was named Deacon? Good. And you got it, I'm sure. We did. Excellent. Excellent. Our, te okay. our team. <laughs> Excellent. Well, there's a little bit, um, you can see women in this next slide. This is, I'm sorry that I couldn't get a slide without um, <laughs> the attribution of the people who own it. I couldn't find a slide without, without dreamtime.com. Anyway, so this is, an, this is an exploration by Coder of women and men with the central figure of the notorious scribbler. Can that be moved down a bit, that slide? I can't, I can only see, maybe that's all that can see. Can't see much of it. Yep, yeah. that's the full image on the screen. Oh, okay, sorry, okay. Linda, does that look correct to you? Yeah, it's the correct um, piece, but it took up my whole slide, so I don't know why the slides are so small. Okay, hang on just a second. Let's see if I can do anything about that. Okay. Any reaction to the scriptures from anybody? Any well, other reaction? One. First one, if you're saved uh, you're, it's through childbearing, it really condemns anyone who couldn't bear children, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. so that, mm -hmm. that really stigmatizes. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we were talking about Sarah and Hagar, you'll remember that there was a judgment in the community against Sarah because she had not born children. 
-hmm. And that happened to uh, Hannah as well. Um, so. Is that better? It, is that better for anybody? It's not better for me. No, it's just it's it's about the same. It's but... the same as it was. That's okay. okay. Though. All right. I just, I just wanted to say the bearing children thing used to be in the marriage vows too. Mm -hmm. When I got married anyway. Oh, wow. Yes. Well, and even um, that you would bear children. That yeah. I would bear children. If it is, mm -hmm. if it is God's will, that used to be the, the qualifying pair. Um, God's will thing wasn't there in my day because I remember I questioned it. No. And if it be God's will for the provision of children. Oh, that's different. And their nurture and the love of the Lord. Why then did did it evolve that uh, nuns, for example, were expected to live a celibate life and therefore would not bear children? That was part of the vows of chastity in within religious communities. So that applied to men and it applied to women. So that their primary devotion was to God or that they would... Uh, in some traditions, they would be wed to Christ as brides of Christ. It was considered a holy vocation. But they, they didn't fulfill the mandate of their agenda to, no. to, bear, to bear children. No, uppity women uh, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in this uh, stained glass, I'm wondering why the figure in the top right, the face is upside down. See in the now red? There's, yeah, there's a supplication there. I don't know, Ruth. I'm not sure what that. Yeah. And the great scribbler is dark skinned. Yes. Well, you can see that in some ways, the artist wanted us to see various locations, right? Mm -hmm. Very, various cities or towns or. And and more, than uh, one, more than one letter. Yes. And letter than, on the left and in the middle and. The yeah. A whole bunch. Um, yeah. A whole bunch over oh. the, by the blue people. So, and the brown people have received a letter that they're looking at together. Mm -hmm. Oh. And I'm curious about the figure um, as we face um, pa the Pauline figure immediately behind him. Is that someone who's ill? Is that is part of the injunction? Is any of among you ill? Then they should call for the church to pray. I don't know. What do you guys think? Are you talking about the two in blue? No, I'm talking oh, about the beige side. right there. Oh, that, right. oh, that side. Yeah, oh. thank you, Michael. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't, I was on the wrong side. Sorry. I don't know. Yeah. And it does look like the woman in red is not silent. She's singing. She has an mm -hmm. instrument. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <coughs> I really like this artist's work. I'm sorry I couldn't get you a better picture, but. Um, Who is it? Hodere, K O D E R. Contemporary. The, women, the women's heads aren't covered. They're... Right? No. So there's a bit of an editorial. Um, the sick woman, artist. Linda, the sick woman. I'm wondering if she's dead. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, because it almost looks like her. she's been all wrapped up. And it's possible. You can hardly see the face. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was awesome. a child. 
don't know, but it certainly draws you in both the colors and the lines and the central figure and obviously all the tablets. And um, I like the, the columns, the knocked over columns on the left, which would remind us of, of Rome, perhaps. Um, and the Parthenon. And the white forms across Greece. Yes, yes. Oh, right. My immediate reaction was the French Revolution. <laughs> Uh, well, there is somebody uprising on the right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll send you. I'll send you the attribution. I'm sorry, I didn't. I was so annoyed that I couldn't get it a clean image. So that's more contemporary. Let's go to the next slide, Michael. Please. This is much more typical of how. Paul is depicted in iconography. There, you can look it up on Google. They're just uh, image after image after image. So, what's what do you notice about this? He's taller than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> he has a sword. He does have a sword. What's that all about? The sword of the spirit. Yeah, it could be the sword of the spirit. Um, Put on the whole armor of God. Yeah. Yes. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's in Ephesians. And we, um, although that is probably not his. But there's another one for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's um, from Hebrews. Apparently not his either. Um, I mean, it's interesting. It's, the Bible, sorry. what appears to be a, a Bible or a, um, in, in one hand and then the sword in the other. So is there uh, some balance there? I don't know. It's, it's possible. Um, he died by the sword. Mm -hmm. He was beheaded. And um, I guess it was in... Where do I have that? Wasn't it in Rome that he? Yes, I was just looking for the date in, in around, at around 64 AD. Mm -hmm. It was beheaded in, in Rome. So very often in the iconography, you will see him presented with a sword. Doesn't look like anybody I'd want to meet in a dark alley, let's say. <laughs> he, well, he looks pretty scary. <laughs> Ah, he's intense, and I think that that would kind of yeah. fit the personality. Um, certainly bald. Um, we can't tell anything about his bad knees here, uh, or his uh, stature, his physical stature, but certainly his face. He looks I think bald, he has. As you said. Uh, I'm sorry. He looks bald, as you said yeah. earlier. That's how he was depicted. What's the date of this? Is this an ancient one or fairly recent? Yes, no, this is an ancient one. This oh. is about, this, um, I think it was the sixth century. Oh. He, he I doesn't think he look looked, like, he doesn't look like he's out there spreading the good news. I mean, <laughs> whatever he's going to talk about is not good. <laughs> Well, I think that that's part of what we're exploring, Ruth, is that there's a lot of ambiguity. We just finished reading yeah. that wonderful letter um, to the Romans. And, um, and certainly there's the iconographer wanted you to see that there was an intense personage who affected, as Nancy said, um, the testament of the church. And we know that the letters of Paul are earlier than the Gospels. And so well, yeah, I, I think he's just spoken to the women 
and said all those wonderful things to them. And that sword is the or else. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, he's, he looks so serious and so intense there. And it, it makes me think about, I think in at least some of the letters, uh, he um, is quite wound up about uh, false prophets or false mm. uh, false uh, 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 preachers or missions and uh, he's really warning uh, against that and and I can't I'm sorry I don't remember now which uh, which letters but I do recall that that uh, came up yes and also you'll remember that he he had arguments with people Yes. So partially in, in um, the book of Acts, we'll hear about um, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, and then later on it's Paul and Barnabas. So, um, and eventually Barnabas drops off in Antioch altogether. And then you have, um, who else did he fuss with? besides Barnabas, but he, Silas, I think he had, he had fusses with Silas, although he seemed to like Timothy and Titus, or at least they were seen as worthy recipients of his, of the letters. But he had fights. The sense, I'm sorry. The sense that I get when I look at this is defender or protector of the faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, very staunch holding on. And in other iconography, you'll see that he, Paul is also depicted with Peter. Let's go on to um, the next slide, which is a poem in prose form by uh, Stephen Mitchell from his book, Parables and Portraits. So who would, who would like to read this one? I have it really enlarged on mine, so I'll be happy to read it. Thank you, Michael. Stepping from the clear air of the gospel into your mind, I found myself hemmed in, darkened, struggling for my natural breath. Yes, brother, I know what you glimpsed on the road to Damascus, the sense of boundless freedom that shot electric through every nerve in your body, and all the strictures of thou shalt not gave way. The dead weight of authority lifted, and your only duty was to the law written in your inmost heart. You were born again, but with the bloody remains of your former self smeared over you, ardent and headstrong as usual, you leapt from the delivery room table straight out into the world to teach the Gentiles your truth. You left no time for yourself to remain a child, to grow inside the kingdom of heaven slowly and naturally as a tree grows by the water streams, then ripens and bears fruit in its own season. No time for your dogmatism and intolerance and resentment to fall away by themselves, letting you shed your guilt as your old enemy, the serpent, sheds his skin. And so you remain with a past, a future, and a now caught between them in which God the judge kept watching you through a one-way mirror darkly. I would like to arrange a meeting between you and the true Messiah, you can call him Jesus if you like. I would have you sit in my backyard on a perfect day like today with a continuous bird song and a mild breeze stirring the fig tree, a fresh baked sourdough baguette on the picnic table, three glasses and a bottle of a nice California port. He might not say a word of the good news according to Summer. Perhaps it would be enough to see him face to face as he sips the wine and hands you a piece of the bread Take, eat, this is your body. So Stephen Mitchell clearly feels that Paul went from 100 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour, just in a different lane and that he might have benefited from growing more slowly into the new faith in Jesus. What do you, what do you think? Uh, 
this, this one really resonates with me. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, Paul in his own, in his own description, I think it's in Galatians says, well, you know, I went to Arabia and I spent three years thinking about all this after my conversion. And then I went back and I yeah. talked to the people in the church and everything. But the, but I think Stephen Mitchell is, is very likely right because, you know, what you grew up with, what Paul grew up with was hard to overcome, even in a dramatic conversion experience, even, you know, with three years of reflecting on things, because it's hard to grow past the, what you grew up with in, as a child. And I say that from my own experience, because I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and I learned certain things there. I was, I learned certain interpretations there. And I find even now, you know, that I come out with some things that I say, oh my gosh, how could I, how could I say that? How could I believe that? And, and, I, and it comes from the way I grew up. Um, <laughs> So I, I, you know, I can, I can, I can go with this one. I, I, I hear this. So. Mm -hmm. So it um, reminds me of people heading into retirement who, um, the tiger doesn't change its stripes. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> Linda, right. you know, the, the pot calling the kettle black here. Um, I'm the same person I think while I was working as I was I mean I'm the same person while I was getting paid <laughs> yes um but what what does the poet want for Paul what is his heart's desire that Paul get That, that Mitchell seems to think that he's missing. The last paragraph seems to indicate that he wants to get him to know Jesus on a more personal level, more intimate level, like at the, at the picnic table with the, I'm going to change it to Niagara Port, <laughs> California. <laughs> Um, that's what I get from the last chapter and I know, or the last um, paragraph, yeah. I know you were saying he wants him to slow down yeah. maybe, that leads into that. It seems to me he's saying that Paul is motivated by the guilt of having persecuted the church. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so that has confirmed him in his dogmatism and intolerance and resentment. Um, he showed that against the new Christians. Now he's showing it against perhaps the opponents of the new uh, Christians. And I think the author is saying that he should relax and let himself grow into the kingdom as naturally as a tree grows. I mean, I, I don't think our faith, we ever reach the end. I, I don't think we ever reach absolute certainty. We're always growing and sometimes we're more certain than others. And then we're always um, uh, growing in our faith, certainly. And just uh, sit down, have a glass yeah. of wine, stop fighting a theological battle, just encounter what it means to be fed. And the sacraments will work in you even if you don't understand everything about how it means. Yeah. All you have yeah. to do is take and eat. And it's your body too, not just his, which is a very interesting twist at the end. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, partially, I think Mitchell's referring to um, the body of work at some level, kind of a back, a backdrop here. And somewhat to the argument that goes on about James, because the last paragraph seems to be saying, not only take your time, but experience Christ through your senses and not through your actions. Yeah. Yeah. 
So here, perhaps Paul was Paul able to do that. that. Let's, Let's go, go to, to the, the next, next slide. slide. So the next slide is Rembrandt. I should tell you that Rembrandt also did a self-portrait um, where he imagined himself as Paul. And it's a sweet little soft portrait. Um, I couldn't find any um, description about why he did that, although Rembrandt often put himself in other biblical characters. Um, he will come in, uh, in one of the Joseph pieces forward. He'll come forward in that. This is um, Rembrandt's portrait of Paul in prison. Next week, we'll also see uh, Rembrandt depicting himself as Nicodemus. Mm. Very interesting. So there you can see the sword. Yeah. You can see a number of books, text, collection of texts. One open on his on his lap, a couple more nearby. He has an unshod foot. What do you think that's all about? He looks old. He looks tired. Yeah. Yeah. Not much point putting a, sh a sandal on if you can't go anywhere. Mm. And you're right, Susan. This is pensive, pensive. Reflective, reflective, and old. And old. Mm -hmm. oh. But is that a light light? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, it feels as if there's a light. He's in. He's in the light. Mm -hmm. Always. Always. Mm -hmm. Rembrandt's very, very good. good. Okay. okay. Next, Next slide. slide. Okay. okay. Let's see, is this too small for people to read? A little. Oh, we'll see if I can. I was trying to see if I can, I can enlarge one side at a time. Do they go together? Yes, they do. Okay. Um, Patricia sent me this um, poem. Do you want to read it, Patricia? Julia Alvarez? No, you're muted. Thank you. First off, we start with Eve, who misbehaved, taking a bite of the forbidden fruit. A woman not afraid to risk God's ire or Adam's blame, to know good from evil. Or Lot's wife, does she even have a name? Who suffered death because she chose to turn. Oh, so to love the sight of what she loves, the red roof on her house, her line of wash, that she gave up salvation for a glimpse. My kind of woman, bold and curious. I like the quiet, pensive ones as well. Mary, so often praised for the wrong things, her humbleness, her sweet docility, her loving parenting of Jesus Christ, instead of her most worthy quality, her Buddhist calm in the face of shocking news, that she was pregnant with the Son of God she didn't balk or ask to be excused or worry what her parents were going to think. My kind of virgin, guilt and fancy free. So I need the other side. Speaking of virgins, I'll end with Joan of Arc. How many smart young women wouldn't want to cut their hair and bind their breasts and roam far from their father's house on their own, making the world safe for womankind. I see a theme, smart bodies with big mouths on whom nothing is lost, big hearted gals, husbands, priests, daddies, bosses, sultans, dons, choose for your chattel, 
the pliant, docile ones. My kind of women aren't the ones you want. Contemporary pushback. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also pulling some of our women or other women forward. Next slide, Michael, thank you. It is we sinful women who are not awed by the grandeur of those who wear gowns, who don't sell our lives, who don't bow our heads, who don't fold our hands together. It is we sinful women while those who sell the harvests of our bodies become exalted, become distinguished, become the just princes of the material world. It is we sinful women who come out raising the banner of truth up against barricades of lies on the highways, who find stories of persecution piled on each threshold, who find that tongues which could speak have been severed. It is we sinful women. Now, even if the night gives chase, these eyes shall not be put out. For the wall which has been raised, don't insist now on raising it again. It is we sinful women who are not awed by the grandeur of those who wear gowns, who don't sell our bodies, who don't bow our heads, who don't fold our hands together. Contemporary women trying to be present. This is uh, Rikshana Ahmad is um, Urdu. It makes me think of uh, women in countries that are really governed by religious fundamentalists and how hard that is uh, for women. And so they get labeled as outsiders or worse. I've got a simple. question for Joe. I've got a question for Joe. Um, yeah. How, were the Southern Baptist women of a certain type attending church? Did they have to conform to a certain like could you could any of these you know were they sort of the quote nice women that never raised a ruckus or how was there a characteristic of you're muted now Joe I'm sorry. You were muted. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, I I lost myself there for a while. I don't know where I was. So, anyways. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Dorothy was asking if uh, Baptist women were more. Oh, I'm sorry. I did close. Not hear that. Yeah, closed mouthed. Um, compliant uh, yeah more they behaved better <laughs> than the rest of us <laughs> well i'm asking uh, because i don't know I'm just you know curious yeah i don't know that that's the case um it's interesting well i don't know that's interesting of course there's not a single way that baptist women are but um but many baptist women being good evangelicals would uh, tend to take all of the letters that attributed to Paul to, to heart and therefore would say, well, it's important for me to submit you know, and to be quiet and to do those kinds of things and, um, and not, not make a fuss. So yeah, I mean, I, so I do think that there is a certain amount of truth to to that. Yeah, I think they are a little bit more that way. 
So they would have all been virgin brides or pretended to be at least. Was, there was a lot of white in weddings, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> De rigueur. I think that too, Dorothy, a lot of it has to do with the reading of scripture, whether some texts are weighted more heavily than others. So one of the commentaries I read in preparation for this was written by a fundamentalist uh, woman who really said, if you believe that scripture is divinely inspired and every word has come from the, in essence, a mouth in the hand of God, then you can't disregard what's said. And certainly the letters of Paul, because they are earlier, because they are quite numerous, have been considered another gospel. Yeah. Right. And so another country heard from, the country of Paul's birth. Let's uh, go on to the next slide. I really like this. Joe, do you want to? Try not to resist the changes that come your way. Instead, let life live through you. And do not worry that your life is turning upside down. How do you know that the side you are used to is better than the one to come? I just thought this wisdom from Rumi really applied to Paul landing on his back uh, on the ground, being thrown from his horse. Caravaggio has quite a dramatic um, painting of that of that scene. But how do we know that the side we're used to is better than the one that is yet to be revealed? We don't really know, do we? No. So this applies to me, even in my understanding um, of Paul. I may have understood him um, on a single dimensional plane more than I should have. And we, we can do that. We can hear and see people um, in only one context and maybe not in the fullness. And or at their worst moment when they were really crabby and said, just shut up. <laughs> when that's not the best message to write down. So next. Okay, and the attribution, uh, there is an attribution for this as well. Um, who would like to read this? I'll read it. Thank you. Earring, you lost it. The pre-dawn sky still held stars and she shivered against their, beneath their cold light. Arms crossed against the weather, eyes darting, yet her posture is held tight. The stars light up the sidewalk and her darting eyes look tired. She sighs, glancing at the ground once more, then checks how much time transpired. Her hand touches her ear, checking to see if she missed it. It's still not there, and the night is fading. Yet she doesn't want a replacement. Her hands fall to her side with a thud, and her heels clack loudly. She's done what she could, yet there's a risk paid for acting proudly. She didn't look back to the grass where a small object reflected the starlight. The earring was there, but it was fading away with the night. It isn't the only thing I lost. And this poem for me was trying to imagine what it's like to have had a voice and to have lost it. And I'm remembering uh, Mary Piper's book, Reviving Ophelia, which said that young women at about the age of 12 start losing their voice. And so in response to that, we developed um, 
a diocesan program called the Girls Leadership Project, where we handed young women the stories of strong women in scripture and help them learn what it was to lead their own worship and do some art and poetry. And this uh, reminded me of Paul saying, no jewelry, or the letter to First Timothy saying, no jewelry, cover your head. This next to the last slide is one of uh, many sculptures of the beheading of Paul, where the sword comes into play. This is in St. Paul's outside the walls in Rome, where Paul's bones are buried. Just to help us all remember that there's a fuller life than the one letter that you wrote. <laughs> And the final slide, please, Michael. Why did I pick this one? The hand is not the hand of the person whose face we see. Perhaps, perhaps, Ruth. It's possible that he is being silenced. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? If we could see, if he could see the future that was lying in wait for him. Then what? It's quite daunting. I think his. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. Oh, I was going to say. I think um, uh, looking at his eyes, he looks searching, seeking. There's an intensity around the eyes to me, but it, it's like he's searching. So no one seems to feel that he is giving the the admonition himself. It's very ambiguous. Yeah, it is. It is. So Claudia had mentioned that Sumon Kid's Book of Longing, um, which I have yet to read, but she's a wonderful writer. So I think um, what I wanted to leave you with was who says you can't speak? When is it? appropriate to be silent and when is it to release your voice and when do you need to move beyond what you knew. And would Paul have been better off if he'd written fewer letters? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I've gone past our time, and so I want to thank you all for being here. Is there any anything else? Oh, thanks, Joe. Any anything else uh, that anybody wanted to say? Just a different take, all based on that one wacko poem. <laughs>